Okay, so um, it's 11 o'clock, so we should go ahead and get started. Um, I will say that uh, uh, Stefan Savage had the idea, I have one extra one of these shirts, that it would be fun to try to get um, all the speakers to sign said shirt. Uh, so we're, I don't know what we'll do with it afterward, but one thing I've noticed in uh, putting together this, helping to put together this day, is that we don't have a lot of memorabilia. I actually think it would have been really fun to try to collect all the SOSP t-shirts, or at least photos of them, or all the SOSP locations. And we could still do that. So if you have t-shirts that you could take pictures of, or you have, um, photos that you've taken. Um, Andy Tannenbaum sent me a bunch of pictures, which I showed a few at the end of the slide set that I used in the morning. But it would be really great to still try to collect some of the memorabilia we have, at least digital photos of them. OK, with that, without further ado, um, I, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce Sacha, um, who is the Carnegie Group Professor of CS at CMU. Um, he was also SOSP chair in 2001. Um, he is the principal architect and implementer of a number of very important file systems, AFS and CODA, um, invented in, in areas of scalable file caching, ACL-based security, disconnected operation. And he's going to be talking today about an impressionistic view, which I love that, impressionistic view of memory and file systems over a 60-year period uh, with focus on some four key attributes and ideas. Please welcome Sacha. Great. Um, so when I was asked to give this talk, it, it seemed like an impossible task. How on earth could I possibly condense 60 years of work by many people in this room into a 25 minute talk? And I realized I shouldn't even try. There's going to be no way that I'm going to properly attribute all the advances. If we were to ask our colleagues in physics, for example, tell us about the history of your field, what would they say? They wouldn't try to say what each person did they might do something like this. They might say, look, the th really important things in our field are, you know, we have four fundamental forces, uh, gravity, electromagnetism, weak and strong nuclear forces, and here's how they play out and create the phenomena of the world. And I wondered, you know, I wonder if this is possible with us. And so I'm going to try. Tell me at the end whether it worked or it was a failure. So at the core of all of the huge amount of work in our field, have been four drivers, four forces. One of them, from day one, has been the quest for scale. In the early days, memory was so scarce that just getting enough of it to do the next bigger problem, to get the next uh, uh, challenge solved, was difficult. And so this was an obsession. And hand in hand with scale went speed. Now, processing speed usually was thought of as the job of the processor, but the memory was not far behind. The tail could wag the dog, and so uh, the speed of the memory subsystem was also extremely important. So this kept us going for roughly about 10 to 15 years. But by the early 1960s, a number of people, including most importantly IBM, which was the leader of the field at that time, and in, in certainly among companies, realized that having to reprogram all your applications for each new generation of machine was simply an unsustainable approach. And so they came up with the concept of transparency in hardware. You could have a whole range of machines with different performance characteristics and performance uh, uh, scalability, and your programs wouldn't have to change. That separation, which is another flavor of the abstraction concept that Barbara talked about, was in fact instrumental in making a lot of advances possible. By the late 1960s, it was not just transparency in the form of ease of programming that mattered, it was also getting the programs right and helping the systems that were built to remain up and functioning correctly. So these two last attributes, transparency and robustness, have gained in importance over time as hardware costs have gone down and people costs, both in terms of programming costs as well as user costs, have gone up. So the rest of my talk is really looking a little bit into each of these and trying to tell a story about them 
that describes what we have seen over the last many years. I want to emphasize that these are not obviously independent axes. They interact in complex ways, and it's in fact the complexity of this interaction that gives rise to so many interesting phenomena that we study. So this one slide captures an amazing amount of information, not all of which I can go over, but it describes the cost per megabyte over 1955 to today. And the type of data, type of data object, data storage object, whether it is disk or RAM or core, is also marked in here. The important message from this slide is the 13 orders of magnitude reduction in the cost per megabyte over this period of time. Nothing else in human experience comes close to this kind of speed of improvement or range of improvement. Now, as our ability to include more memory and more storage in computer systems increased, so did the need for us to be able to address it, to be able to name it. And the early history of our field is filled with examples of short-sightedness, where we thought 12 bits would last us a long time, and soon realized we needed 16, and so on and so forth. Even as recently as 1981, just only 30 years ago, half the history of our field, when the IBM PC was built and MS-DOS was created, it had a much tinier address space than the VAX, which was four years older than that. Famously, Bill Gates mentioned, who could possibly need more than a megabyte of memory, right? Fortunately, I hope we have overcome this. Today, 64 bits is what we have on most systems, and hopefully it'll last us a while. Hand in hand with the ability to address numerically, which is what we think of as addressing, was also the need to name objects, persistent objects. And here, the classic file system hierarchical namespace was the first. We had, for relational databases, we had SQL, which gave us very flexible but precise naming by content. And much more recently, we have had the ability to search using keywords. And you can think of it as a kind of addressing. You don't really need to know the name of that ghastly URL if, in fact, you can just type in a few keywords. Now, remember, one difference is that the first two, hierarchical namespaces and SQL, are programmatically usable. You can write code that uses them. Search engines today still require a human being in the loop. It's hard to write software that uses the output directly. Sometime in the mid-'90s, the notion of using cryptographic hashing as the basis of addressing blocks of storage became widely used. Uh, R-Sync was an example. Venti was one of the first systems that used this in an archival context. Uh, David Mazier's system LBFS was one of the first examples <coughs> in SOSP that showed us how to use this technique very effectively. And this has gained enormous importance. Today, it typically goes by the name deduplication, and it's typically used as a way of storage optimization. But fundamentally, it's a form of naming. Butler has talked about capability-based systems. And indeed, my point here completely concurs with the point that he made, namely, short-term capabilities have been very effective. The notion of performing some complicated check and then obtaining a cryptographic file handle that is then good for a few seconds, minutes, maybe hours. That is very effective. Many systems use it. Long-term capabilities have had an interesting history. If you go back to the early 70s, mid-70s, early 80s even, there was a huge amount of interest in capability-based systems. Um, systems like Hydra, built at Carnegie Mellon by Bill Wolf and his team, uh, were an early example of such a system. And at SOSB 1981, there were three papers on a capability-based system called Intel IAPX. And nobody thinks about that system anymore. At least we don't discuss it very much these days. So this seems to be an idea that has fallen out of favor. It's an interesting uh, uh, discussion over drinks, whether 
it should be resurrected, and if so, why? So that's, in a nutshell, some of the key landmarks in the quest for scale. How about speed? This one graph from Dave Patterson and John Hennessy's textbook tells most of the story. And it's a pretty depressing story from the viewpoint of memory. Since 1980, both memory and processing have been done with silicon, DRAM and silicon processing. But the curves have different slopes. And the increasing gap between them has been the fundamental story of the quest for speed as far as memory is concerned. Now, 1980 is 30 years after the birth of the time frame that I'm talking about. So what happened during those first 30 years? Here's some data that I could get. And I think the most relevant thing is to look at the IBM 360. And if you look at the CPU bandwidth and the memory bandwidth, you notice that the lower end models have much slower memory bandwidth. Fascinating that the Model 91 actually had higher memory bandwidth than processing bandwidth. So in 1967, if you had a big data problem, that was the machine to use. Okay? And indeed, that's what it was used for. It was used in the Apollo space program, it was used in nuclear weapon simulation, and so on. The IBM 370 series, whoops, um, which came in uh, about seven years later, had two milliseconds of access time and almost one order of magnitude faster processor cycle time. And these were typically one instruction per cycle. So by then, even though it was about 10 years before DRAM was used in, in, in all machines virtually, uh, it was the case that the gap between processor and memory speeds had already emerged. Is that microseconds? Sorry, yes, yes. Uh, my, my symbol conversion didn't quite work. Um, so what do you do? The answer from very early in the history of computing has been the invention of the concept of a memory hierarchy, where you use a relatively small amount of memory that is very close in speed to the processor and combine it with the mainstream memory of that era, which has the speeds that I just showed you. And if you do this cleverly, you get the speed of the small, faster memory, but the scale of the commodity memory of that era. And doing this intelligently and cleverly has been the subject of a lot of the research published in this forum over multiple decades. So one way to think about working set is that it's a measure of the goodness of fit of a memory hierarchy to the workload and to the specific sizes of memory uh, that are being, mem memory components that are being used in the system. There have also been many efforts, such as striping, use of sharding, use of bit torrent when networks are involved, to use data paths, parallel data paths, to increase bandwidth. And these have complemented the latency improvements, which have been the challenge. That is the hard part. Bandwidth is usually a lot easier to improve than latency. Now, one of the messages that comes across as you read the papers over multiple decades is how well LRU and minor variants of LRU have worked. People have, have done many alternative approaches, and very few of them have ended up giving lasting improvements over uh, LRU. There have been two workloads for which LRU has always been suboptimal, and that is sequential scan, which has no temporal locality at all, even though it has excellent spatial locality, and purely random access. And in fact, in the real world, this does happen. You do see these workloads, for example, every night, if you do data mining on the transactions on a log, you get sequential access. Netflix, for example, any video playback or streaming has this kind of access pattern. Uh, if you look at hash data structures, the act of hashing deliberately randomizes memory accesses, thereby defeating some of the very clever hashing strategies in a multi-level memory hierarchy. So these two have always been thorns in our side for as long as we can remember. People have tried to overcome these so far. The best that I've seen is an approach that um, 
was developed at IBM about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, um, called the Adaptive Replacement Cache. Very clever, very simple. It has actually been used in IBM storage controllers. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I've not seen one that is better than this. And one of the really elegant things about this approach is that it preserves excellent uh, uh, characteristics for LRU-friendly workloads concurrent with the sequential and random access. So in many ways, uh, I think this has been very good. So now we come to the quest for transparency. And here, it's useful to take a moment to ask, what is transparency and why is it so important? I characterize transparency as the ability to present an implementation of some abstraction that is indistinguishable from the original. Okay. Now, why is this important? This is important from a programmer's point of view because your old code works. You don't have to touch it to make it work on the new system. From a user's perspective, it's important because you don't get unpleasant surprises. Okay? Guaranteeing this transparency is hard, and a lot of sweat, especially in industry, goes into preserving transparency. In academia, it's not an attribute that is so well valued. Uh, in program committees, we often dismiss the importance of this, but in fact, in the real world, it is a very, very big factor. Now, the most obvious example of the use of transparency is the importance of caching. And my next few slides are really going to be about this. It's a way of managing a multi-level memory hierarchy that avoids any explicit program intervention. Okay? Now, but that's not the only one. So distributed file systems, the POSIX file system interface, the fact that you can create a distributed implementation of this abstraction and have your programs just work is an example of the power of transparency. Virtual machines, pretending that your whole virtual machine is really there when in fact parts of it are actually missing is another example of the power of transparency. So finding widely used abstractions and then using those as hooks into which to tap in new functionality is a major theme of this group of people over the last many, many decades. So in distributed caches, what you're doing is hiding distribution. The fact that you're not co-located by faking a memory model that really applies to the local case. That's really what a distributed cache does for you. The main question is, how do you cope with the fact that the caches may not all be synchronized? And here, there's been a lot of work on the kind of consistency, and this is the famous uh, uh, eventual consistency versus strict consistency models that have been the subject of much discussion by this group. But it's not the only kind of uh, uh, transparency Memory access costs or time. Do you hide the fact that they're non-uniform from applications? If you do, you have a uniform memory access multiprocessor or uniform memory access system, and there have been many built. At other times, the approach has been to say, hiding this from the program is bad because then placement decisions are bad. The right thing to do is to expose it to the application programmer so that he can make intelligent decisions. And so this has led to the NUMA style. And then, of course, you have the cluster-based computing where there's no sharing of address space, which is NORMA. And one of the interesting abstractions that, that was really motivated by transparency is something we haven't heard in about 15 years, which is distributed shared memory. For a while, every SOSP had multiple papers on this. We haven't seen them for a while, but they're back. Uh, OSDI last had a paper, though it was motivated by cloud offload, cloud mobile offload strategies. But my prediction is they will be back, okay? So stay tuned, this hasn't vanished. So the earliest use of caching that I can find in the literature was actually in the Atlas computer. And that's a screenshot of the paper that reported it. The IBM 360 Model 85 had a hardware cache and many of the ideas such as reference bits, modified bits, um, uh, the use of a set associative cache, all of these ideas were in place by the late 1960s. 
The emergence of distributed file systems like AFS, NFS, the code of file system, all of these in the 80s used caching in that layer. The emergence of the web, very soon after the emergence of the web came things like squid caches, virtual machine state caching, so that you didn't have to fetch the whole 16 gigabyte virtual machine. You could migrate it or fetch parts of it on demand. And then most recently, key value stores like Redis have been used for result caching in, in many systems. So caching as a, as a sort of core concept has been among the most powerful uh, ideas in computing systems. Uh, it's fair to say that it's almost universal. At one end of the spectrum, close to the hardware, you have nanoseconds to make a decision. So the decisions are fast, they're very primitive, the hit ratios, the localities are wonderful, you know, 0.001 miss ratio is common, uh, but you don't have time to do a lot. So all of the decisions have to be very, very fast. Close to the user, you have the luxury of milliseconds, maybe even seconds. You can execute a lot of instructions and be very sophisticated in that time. But the problem is that just the miss ratio doesn't say everything. You may have only one file missing, but that may be the file that you most critically need for tomorrow. Right? So um, it, this, is, this is the sort of the layout of the landscape as far as the range of use cases for caching in systems. So these are soft differences. And one of the interesting points I want to make is the importance of demand fetch. Um, we assume that it's possible to intercept reads and inject code that uh, performs the demand fetch. Unfortunately, if you look at a system like Dropbox, which is very popular, makes a lot of money, it doesn't do that. And so the price you pay for it is that some things we take for granted with caching, such as the ability to be very fine-grained about the data that you need or the data update that you need to propagate cannot be supported. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Um, coping with system failures. Here are some of the techniques that we have looked at over time, the use of RAID, the use of wear leveling for flashes. All of these ideas have been driven by the motivation of robustness. On the human side, the ability to cope with human error motivated ideas such as the use of separate address spaces. The ability to provide users with a way to go back in time and to look at their files that they may have accidentally deleted. Motivated ideas such as Elephant and the Apple Time Machine. And even the idea of a single level store, which has resurfaced from time to time, has always fallen back because of concerns that such a flat space could easily be hurt by, for example, bad programming, programming error. The fact that you have a narrow interface separate from the flat interface of the memory system helps with robustness. I want to end with just one set of observations. There's been a lot of discussion about whether classic file systems are dead. Respected members of this community have expressed the opinion that they do. And it appears true at a high level. If you look at an Android smartphone, um, you don't see a file system anywhere. Even a programmer sees Java classes and sees um, SQLite, doesn't see the file system. But of course, buried deep inside is the native layer, which is a classic Linux file system. Now, I want to point out that this is not a view new viewpoint. That, that quote from 1996, the impending demise of file systems, OK? We'll argue whether 20 years constitutes impending, <laughs> OK? So in the interest of time, I'm only going to say this, that file systems are hierarchical, not because we don't know any better, but because they perfectly match the limits of human cognition. And phenomena such as temporal locality and spatial locality are emergent phenomena that come from the intersection between hierarchical file systems and the limits of human cognition. So for those of you who'd like to read more about this, Look at this work on the architecture of complexity by Herb Simon. Very insightful. And I will close by saying that 
like the proverbial quote from Mark Twain, I do think hierarchical file systems will be with us for a long time to come. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sacha. Do we have a question? It's hard to see. The lights are a little different than they were this morning, it feels like. No? No. Okay, well, then I'm going to give you your OS principles t-shirt. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Gina. <laughs>